Welcome to SPI's presentation on the Clinical Practice Improvement Activities of MIP. This webinar will provide a general overview of the Quality Payment Program, primarily focusing in on the MIP track. We would like to recap on the Quality and Advancing Care Information category as per the final rule before we look at the requirements for the Clinical Practice Improvement Activity. I'll explain how you can receive full credit in this performance category, as well as review several samples of those practice activities. MACRA introduced us to the new quality payment program. There are two tracks, MIPS and APM. MIPS stands for the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, and it's made up of four performance categories, quality, advancing care information, clinical practice improvement activities, and resource use. In 2017, advanced APMs have been identified as the comprehensive end-stage renal disease care model, Medicare Shared Savings Program, Next Generation ACO, Comprehensive Primary Care Plus, and the Oncology Care Model. For the first two years of the MIP, program, eligible clinicians are MDs, DOs, dentists, dental surgeons, podiatrists, optometrists, chiropractors, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and certified registered nurse anesthetists. The secretary may broaden the group of eligible clinicians by the year 2019 to include physical and occupational therapists, speech-language pathologists, audiologists, nurse midwives, clinical social workers, clinical psychologists, dietitians, and other nutritional professionals. This list of professionals may voluntarily report on MIPS measures and activities, but you would not be subject to the MIPS payment adjustments, which begins in 2019. There are three groups of eligible clinicians who will not be subject to MIPS. One, if it's your first year of Medicare participation. Two would be if you are already participating in an APM and you qualify for the bonus payment. And third is if you are an eligible clinician but you fall below the low volume threshold, which is defined as Medicare Part B billing charges less than or equal to $30,000 or you provide care for 100 or fewer Medicare patients in one year. Again, MIPS does not apply towards hospital or facility charges. For 2017, the eligible clinician's composite score is made up of the three performance categories of MIPS. That is quality, which is worth 60% of the composite score. Advancing care information makes up 25% of your score. And the clinical practice improvement activities is worth 15% of the clinician's composite score. Now the four, fourth performance category, which is resource use, will not be factored into your composite score in 2017. However, starting in 2018, the resource use category will count for 10% of the composite score, and then it increases to 30% by the year 2019. The clinician's composite score will be compared to the overall MIP threshold, and for 2017, that has been set at three points. So the clinician who has achieved a composite score of three points or higher will receive a neutral to a positive payment adjustment. Clinicians who get three points or below will get neutral to a negative payment adjustment. MIPS payment adjustments begin in the year 2019 at a negative or positive 4%. Budget neutrality is factored in. 
and it is three times the year's percentage rate. So it is potential that those clinicians receiving a positive payment adjustment could get up to a positive 12% in their reimbursement. Now, budget neutrality works by the difference that was not paid out to those clinicians receiving negative payment adjustments. That money is then redistributed to those receiving a positive payment adjustment. So budget neutrality only impacts those receiving a positive payment adjustment, giving them the potential to earn higher than the year's percentage rate. There is a separate payment adjustment for those who perform exceptionally well. There's a separate bucket of money. $500 million will be available each year starting from 2019 until 2024 and the clinician could receive up to an additional 10%. So for the year 2017, if a clinician receives a composite score of 70 points or higher, they would then be eligible for this additional positive payment adjustment. Again, that could be up to 10%. You can report as an individual or as a group, and an individual will be identified using the combination of their billing PIN and MPI. Now, a group, which is two or more eligible clinicians identified by their MPI, who have reassigned their billing rights to a single PIN. It's very important to note that you must use the same identifier for all performance categories of MIPS. In 2017, the clinician can pick their pace, and there's three options to choose from. The first option is to test the quality program. You would be required to report on one quality measure or one clinical practice improvement activity or the base score measures of the advancing care category for a minimum, a minimum of 90 days. Uh, in doing so, you would avoid a negative payment adjustment. The second option is that you're reporting on all activities and measures in the three performance categories for a minimum of 90 days to potentially receive a positive payment adjustment. Again, it depends on how well you do in the activities and measures and how strong your composite score is. And then the third option is that you are participating for a full calendar year, reporting again on all activities and measures. Now, the eligible clinician who um, does not participate in 2017 will automatically receive the full negative 4% adjustment to their 2019 payment. There are several data submission options to choose from, whether or not you're reporting as an individual or as a group. Um, please note that all MIP data must be submitted by March 31st of 2018. Um, and for our larger groups of 25 or more who choose to use the CMS web interface, you would need to register as a group by June 30th of 2017. The key note to remember is that you can only use one submission mechanism per category. CMS provides us with a wonderful website for the quality payment programs. Please go to qpp.cms.gov there you can access the final rule, find um, fact sheets regarding the quality payment programs, both for MIPS and the APM, as well as all the measures and activities that fall within MIPS. For 2017, the quality performance category of MIPS makes up 60% of the clinician's composite score. This is replacing the current PQRS program, which is sunsetting at the end of 2016. 
you're required to report on six quality measures. One of the six measures must be an outcome measure. If an outcome measure is not available, then the clinician would need to choose another high priority measure. If you are a group of 25 or more clinicians who choose to use the CMS web interface to report on quality measures, you would need to report on 15 measures for a full calendar year. As I mentioned, if a high out or an outcome measure is not available for your specialty, you would then need to select one high priority measure, which is identified as appropriate use, patient safety, efficiency, patient experience, and care coordination. You'll note that some of the measure types are listed as an intermediate outcome measure, and they are considered an outcome measure for the purpose of scoring. You can select your measures from an individual list or from MIP specialty measure sets. Now, the measures that fall within these measure sets are not unique. They're the same measures that you find within the individual list. They've just been sorted uh, according to the American Board of Medical Specialties. It makes it a little bit more convenient when you're trying to sort through all those measures to decide what is best for your specialty or practice. You will note that the measure sets do vary in the number of measures they contain, and each one of those measure sets do have either an outcome measure and or high uh, priority measure for you to choose from. Now, if a measure set has less than the required six, you must report on all the measures within the set so you do not, so it does not have a negative impact on the final score for this performance category. However, if a measure set has more than the six, you simply have to choose six and make sure that you have either the outcome or high priority measure. Here is a list of the measure sets for 2017. Each one of the measures will be converted to points on a scale from 3 to 10. You will receive a zero for any measure that is not reported, and you do get bonus points if you report on additional outcome or high priority measures. So above what is required, if you report an additional outcome measure, you would get two points. And if you report on a high priority measure above and beyond what's required, you would get one point for each one of those high priority measures. You do get one point for each measure that is reported um, through EHR, through your EHR, that all totaled up would then be divided by the total possible points, which would give you your category score for the quality performance category. And again, if you refer to the QPP website and select Explore Measures, and then go to the quality measures, you will find that you can filter by keyword searches or you can access those specialty measure sets, which will filter and show you the uh, measures that have been identified for that specialty. Um, also take note that you can filter by submission method. Very important when you're making your quality measure selection that you can submit all these me uh, measures through one submission mechanism. If you click on the measure name itself, it gives you a drop-down window, giving you the full description of the measure and the measure type. Again, identifying it whether or not it's high priority, um, patient safety, outcome, et cetera. In 2017, the Advancing Care Information Performance category of MIPS makes up 25% of the clinician's composite score, and it is replacing the Medicare's Meaningful Use Program. 
Now, the Medicare Meaningful Use Program sunsets at the end of 2016. However, the Medicaid Meaningful Use will continue on. This category is made up of a base score, performance score, and bonus points. The base score will yield you 50 points. You could earn up to an additional 90 points on the measures that fall within the performance score, and you can receive 5% bonus for public health registry reporting and 10% bonus points for one CPIA. All totaled, any clinician receiving 100 or more points, and you will be capped at 100 points, um, they would receive the full 25% towards their composite score, or 25 points. Now, the base score just shows your basic participation in this performance category. You would have to answer yes to protect patient health information, which means you run a security risk analysis during your reporting period, and you fulfill the remaining three measures by having at least one in the numerator for each one, that is e-prescribing, provide patient access, and health information exchange. By fulfilling the four measures listed here, you would automatically get the 50 points. If you would like to increase the amount of points you are receiving within this performance category, you can choose the additional measures listed here. Um, some are worth up to 20% uh, points and some are listed as 10%. There are no thresholds, but you really do wanna to try to achieve the best possible score. Um, they will take the numerator and denominator and convert it into a point. So the measures listed here are health information exchange. This is a measure that you do find within the base score, uh, immunization registry reporting, medication reconciliation, patient education, provide patient access. This also is a measure that is found within the base score secure messaging, view, download, and transmit. So again, select the measures that best fit your practice. There is no threshold, but you do want a very good uh, numerator compared to the denominator so you can yield the most points possible for the measure. Any eligible clinician that is in an active engagement with a public health agency submitting data um, will receive a 5% bonus. And you could receive a 10% bonus by completing at least one of the clinical practice improvement activities. There are 18 selected measures uh, practice measures that you can choose from that will yield this 10% bonus. Uh, you do not have to worry about the weight of that practice measure. Um, there are 18 out of a possible 90 practice activities that will yield this bonus. And here is a sample of one of those practice activities, which is provide 24-7 access to eligible clinicians or groups who have real-time access to patients' medical record. And we can see here by the functionality of an EHR, um, it really does support this practice activity by means of providing patient access, secure messaging, sending and receiving care summaries. So by completing uh, this practice activity, not only would it yield points within the clinical practice improvement activity performance category, it will yield you that 10% bonus in the advancing care information category. 
And again, if you go to the QPP website, select Explore Measures and go to the Advancing Care Information tab, you'll notice that there's going to be two tabs on that website. Um, for Chartmaker clients, you want to make sure that you select the 2017 Advancing Care Information Transition Objective and Measures. The reason that there are two tabs is it reflects the measures that fall under which ONC certification your EHR um, is certified in. So we want to make sure, Chartmaker users, you want to make sure that you select that transition objective and measures. For 2017, the clinical practice improvement activities is worth 15% of the clinician's composite score. Now, this is new on a national level, so we cannot compare it to an existing quality program. The activities are focused in on care coordination, beneficiary engagement, and patient safety. The measures are weighted as either high or medium. There's a total of 14 high-weighted activities and 79 medium-weighted activities. In order to receive full credit within this performance category, it's going to depend on your practice size. So for small practices, which are 15 or less eligible clinicians, or if you work in a royal clinic, or you are considered non-patient facing, you would need to perform one high-weighted activity or two medium-weighted activities. Now for the larger groups of 15 or more eligible clinicians, you would need to perform at least two high-weighted activities or four medium-weighted activities, or two medium and one high. If you're a patient-centered medical home, you automatically receive full credit for this performance category. And for other APMs, they will receive half credit, and they could report on additional activities to receive full credit for the performance category. Over the next four slides, we'll be re reviewing some of the practice activities, starting with provide 24-7 access to eligible clinicians or groups who have real-time access to patients' medical records. Note that this is a high-priority measure um, or a high-weighted measure, and this measure as I mentioned earlier, will yield you that 10% bonus under the advancing care information category. So here, you would provide 24-7 access to the MIPS eligible clinician or group or care teams for advice about urgent and emergent care. That could include one or more of the following expanded hours in the evening and weekends with access to the patient's medical record, use of alternatives to increase access to care team by MIPS eligible clinicians and groups, such as e-visits, phone visits, and group visits, et cetera, and or provisions of same day or next day access to a consistent MIPS eligible clinician group or care team when needed for urgent care or transition management. The next practice activity is also a high-weighted activity, and it would yield the 10% bonus in the advancing care information category. And this is the glycemic management services. So for outpatient Medicare beneficiaries with diabetes and who are prescribed an anti-diabetic agent, the MIPS eligible clinician and group must attest to having for the first performance year, at least 60% of the medical records with documentation of on an, individual, on an individualized 
glycemic treatment goal that takes into account the patient's age, comorbidities, and the risk for hypoglycemia, and is reassessed at least annually. Now, the performance threshold will increase to 75% for the second performance year and onward. And so the clinician would attack that 60% for the first year or 75% for the second year of their medical records that document individualized glycemic treatment represent patients who are being treated for at least 90 days during the performance period. Our third sample of the practice activities is a medium weighted activity, and this also would yield that 10% bonus under the advancing care information category. And this is engagement of patients, family, and caregivers in developing a plan of care. So you would engage your patients, their representatives, such as family and caregivers, in developing a plan of care and prioritizing their goals for action and that needs to be documented in, their, in your certified EHR technology. And the last practice activity is also a medium-weighted activity. Um, it would yield that 10% bonus under the advancing care, um, and it is implementation of the medication management practice improvement. So here, managing medications to maximize efficiency, effectiveness, and safety that could include one or more of the following. Reconcile and coordinate medications and provide medication management across transition of care settings and eligible clinicians or groups. Integrate a pharmacist into your care team and or conduct periodic structured medication reviews. Again, these practice activities must be carried out for a minimum of 90 days um, as per pick your pace. Um, many of these activities, though, um, really do need to be carried out throughout the entire year. And if you visit the QPP website, select on Explore Measures, and go to the Improvement Activity tab. There you will find uh, the ability to do keyword searches. Um, you can certainly filter by the weight of the activity. And by selecting on the activity name itself, it will give you a drop-down window that gives you a full description of the practice activity. Here's a list of few key dates you want to keep in mind. Um, as I mentioned, PQRS, Medicare's Meaningful Use, and the Value-Based Modifier Program are sunsetting at the end of 2016. MIPS will begin January 1st. And for our clients who are participating in the Medicare Meaningful Use, your attestation deadline is February 28th. Do note that returning participants in this program can now report on a continuous 90-day period. Um, MIPS will be providing um, performance feedback reports, and the first one will be issued July of 2017, and then a year later in July of 2018. These feedback reports are replacing the QRUR, and so they're going to reflect um, on how well you are doing on the quality measures you're submitting, as well as those cost measures uh, that fall within the resource use category. Again, let me just clarify that the resource use category is not being factored in to the clinician's composite score for 2017. However, CMS will be collecting the data through your claims on those cost measures. So you will see how well you are performing on the cost measures. <clears throat> and MIPS payment adjustments will begin January 1st of 2019.
we are in the comment period for the final rule. If anyone would like to submit any comment or concern regarding the final rule, you can do so um, up to December 19th of 2016. You can submit your comments electronically or through mail. I will remind everyone that your comments are made public, so be mindful as to the content that you share. If you need additional help, you can certainly call the QPT Service Center at 866-288-8292. They are available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Or you can send them an email at qpp at cms.hhs.gov. And this concludes our presentation. I would like to thank everybody for their attendance.